Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents. We're God's Church of Love Online every Saturday and Tuesday. And listen, we are dealing with what's going on in the last days, what's going on with us, how we are to handle things, and what God expects. And we are not to shrink back at the first sign of trouble. But I want you to hear this. I just got Hebrew chapter 12. All right. Now, I'll do a better introduction when I edit this video. But for right now, this is what we got. We're reading Hebrew chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof, are, with, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, verily, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Now, I'm going to stop there for this main reason. I read something and it really, it just resonated in my spirit. I'm going to paraphrase because I can't quote it verbatim. But it's basically saying, when you are called into the body of Christ, you are called into the kingdom of God. And we are not called into the kingdom to be spectators. We are not called in the kingdom to warm the benches and sit in the bleachers. We are called to war. If you are called to war, you cannot expect a picnic for a life. If you are called to war, you cannot expect donuts and ice cream. And everything is pie in the sky and we're tiptoe through the tulips. Tiptoe through the tulips. It's not about that. Not for God's people. God's people are called to war. If you're called to war, you must be prepared for battle. And to be prepared for battle, you must learn to reject your own feelings, reject your own thoughts, reject your own flesh, reject your own desires and tendencies and temptations and worries and fears. And 
we must be focused and we must zero in on the destiny God has placed us on this planet to fulfill. Now I'm going to tell you, not everyone is called to the front lines. Different ones in battle serve different purposes. Some of you are there to mend the wounds of the wounded coming off the front lines because they've been hurt and they need to be healed. Let's just leave it like that. Now, what I want to share with you is we have to really, really take authority over our flesh. We have to really take authority over our minds. And we have to take authority over the demonic realm that would do whatever it can to hinder us, to shut us down, to neutralize us. We are weapons. We are weapons, y'all. In God's hands, we are weapons. And the enemy's camp is doing everything they can to neutralize every weapon they can. The Bible says, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, not whom he can devour, not whom he will devour, but whom he may devour. So we've got to be extra careful in these last days. Okay? Whom he may devour insinuates we give him permission. He can't devour. You ever play the game as a kid? Simon says, jump 10 times. You jump 10 times, you're out. But you have to say, may I? Then they give you permission to jump 10 times. This is a silly little game. But the point is, may I comes with a, per a permissive statement afterwards. Yes, you may, or no, you may not. So when Satan says, may I, you say, no, you may not. You don't sit there and say, okay, no, Satan is not your friend. I love the way Lynn says that he is not your friend. Demons are not your friends. They're not coming out to play y'all. You hear me? They're coming out to kill, to steal, to destroy. And they will use life's vicissitudes to do it with. If you allow them to. So you must ask God for that dog, bulldog determined attitude. That's exemplified in, in, in Rashad's song. No, no, no. Don't go back. No, no, you cannot go back. No. You cannot fall back on the old familiar stuff. You know, I was watching a movie a, a, a couple of years ago where this guy who had been trained by the governments, I mean, it, this goes beyond special ops. This guy was in a very, very small number of specialized agents who, who knew how to ignore physical pain to get the job, to, to fulfill the mission. Now, what happens is what Satan tries to do, this is his strategy. His strategy is to throw up all kind of fires, all kind of crisis, all kind of problems, all kind of resistance, all kind of delays, distractions, temptations, frustrations, whatever, friction, whatever he can stir up, he's going to stir up. Now, the reason for that is to suck us back into our emotions. That's right. Because a person's emotions can neutralize their mind. I talked about this a while back. You have a person. No, oh, okay, I'll share this. This is more personal. Sometimes I like to share the personal experiences so you know that, uh, you know, what I'm really talking about. Years ago, when Milton, he had come off of dialysis and he came home and his arm was bothering him. It just kept itching and itching and itching. And then it stopped the bleeding like they always do before they send him home. 
And we got home. I fed him. I changed his clothes, got him ready for bed. And we were watching TV. And I fell asleep on the couch because I slept on the couch to be right there in case there was an, an emergency when he got off of dialysis. So anyway, so I'm sleeping on the couch. And I hear him, baby, uh, could you check my arm? I'm like, huh? Because I was asleep. He said, could you come check my arm, baby? I said, what's wrong? He said, I think I'm bleeding. My eyes popped open because I know what that means, especially from that. You know, it only takes four minutes, four to six minutes for the body to bleed out. So I jumped up. I said, how long has that been going on? And I could see the blood on the curtains. It was shooting out like somebody squirting a water gun. It was shooting out on the curtains. It was shooting out on the arm of the couch. Some had gotten on me and I didn't realize it. So I jumped up. I said, Milton, this is going to hurt like hell, but you got to deal with it in order for me to have time to call the paramedics. So I balled up a, a, um, a gauze and I literally, he, he had to holler a little bit, but I had to put that much pressure what they do with a, um, a thing in the arm, instead of putting something in the arm, they join a major artery with a big fat vein. And that can just, I mean, it just shoots out. It's like, oh, it's crazy. So I had to put pressure. I knew to put pressure, not to panic. Now, if I had run around, called 911, hurry up, you got to hurry. By the time they got there, Milton would have bled out. If I got caught up in my emotions, y'all, listen. If I got caught up in my emotions, oh, God, oh, no, look at all this blood. What am I going to do? Oh, Milton, let me call 911. And 911 takes three or four minutes to get there. By the time they get out the truck and get in the door, Milton would have been gone. That's if I had gotten caught up in my emotions. But as soon as I felt my emotions going up, I shut them down and I clicked my brain in the high gear. And I said, OK, bleeding is the first thing we deal with. We got to stop it real quick. So I put all the pressure on that gauze on his arm and he was like, oh, baby, that hurts. I said, I know. But if you want to be alive in 10 minutes, it's got to hurt. You got to deal with it right now. I'm sorry. Paramedics came. They were able to control the bleeding. They got him to the hospital. The rest is history. He was still alive. Everything was fine. This is what happens. People panic. When they panic, you get caught up in your emotions when life hits you on your blind side. You get caught up in reaction. And your brain shuts down. And you can easily become a vessel of the devil. Easily. Because either it's going to cause you to sin or it's going to cause you to get so sidetracked that everything God had for you, you miss because you're caught up in the moment. And this is what the moment does. Okay. Take this sheet of paper. This is your destiny all out here. This right here, this piece of paper is the moment. And this is what we tend to do. I'm going to do it sideways so you can see. Oh God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? This is happening and that's happening and that's happening and that's happening. And oh my goodness, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh no, no, no. Oh, 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 oh. And you're so caught up. Then you get angry. Then your mouth flares and your temper flares and your fears flare up. And you don't know what you're going to do in the spirit of confusion. That's right. That's right. You don't know what you're going to do. Now you're starting to hit panic mode. I mean... Before you know it, you have turned an anthill into a mountain. And it starts right here. We have got to learn. That's the reason why one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is so important, which is self-control. We have got to learn 
to ignite that self-control. If we have too little, ask God for more. Because without self-control, people die, people get injured, people get hurt, damage is done. Some of you get fired from a job that you could have held on to for five or ten years because of your tempers. Some of you end up doing time in prison because of your tempers. See, living a holy life is not just about I'm saved, I go to church, I read my Bible, I say my prayers, I forgive, and I try to get along with my fellow man. Yeah, that's nice when everything's going fine and dandy. But when life kicks you in the teeth, you want to kick back, don't you? Because that's what's in our flesh. We are born in sin and shaping in iniquity. That's why we need the Holy Ghost working in our lives. Because with the power of the Holy Ghost, that's where the self-control comes from. You can't do that without the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost changes your nature. Your nature is sinful when you come into Christ. But the Holy Ghost coming into you changes your nature and doesn't about face. And you want to do better. Now, when you keep your mind about you, you don't get caught up. I remember watching a guy on a train. It was the dumbest thing in the world. Some guy had gotten an attitude and he said something smart. Now that could have been ignored. You ignore a fool. That's just what you do with a fool. Ignore it. Act like it's, he's not even in the room. And this person decides he's going to comment back. Now the sad part was the person was a Christian. And he was like, hey, none of your business, blah, blah, blah. And he says, well, well, you know, I can say whatever I want. And next thing you know, they're going blah, blah, blah. Word for word, toe to toe, almost got into a downright brawl over nothing. Letting the emotions get out of hand. When Jesus said, you must take up your cross. You must deny yourself. There's a reason why that word is in there. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. You ever walk it behind your parents when they're walking in the sand and the beach and you jump into their steps and you got to jump real wide because they're so much taller than you and their legs are longer and you're trying to walk in your parents' footsteps in their footprints in the sand. That's what we're to do with Jesus Christ. In attitude, in word, in disposition, in mindset, in internal belief system, we are to respond. If I had responded like a person that had no knowledge, as God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. People die in the ocean. People die in the swimming pool. Babies die in their mother's arms because they stop breathing and the mother does, doesn't dawn on the mother to breathe for the baby. The mother just sits there crying her eyes out, panicking while the baby's dying. So my point is you have to keep your mind about you. When you walk with the Lord, we are called into a war. And yes, we ought to live the abundant life with inner satisfaction, love, joy, peace, faith, all of that. But we have to maintain that while being under the barrage of being under fire from the enemy. While life is coming against us, 
We got to reach that much harder for the love, joy, faith, peace. We got to reach hard for it. You got to be determined. You got to go after it like a pit bull. You try to pull a piece of meat out of the jaws of a pit bull. Can't do it, can you? Right. But faith, power, the Holy Ghost, all of that, that can undo it. But when you are determined, you've got to use that same attitude that the pit bull has, and you've got to latch on and never let go. I don't care if... <laughs> I don't care if the devil is trying to jerk that thing out of your mouth and your mouth is going with it. Don't let go. Don't let go of your faith in God. Don't let go of holiness. I don't care how ugly people act out there. You do not have to bow. You do not have to stoop to their level. Shut your mouth and walk away even if you feel like you look like the biggest fool on the planet. Your pride does not deserve attention. Your pride does not deserve a defense. Ignore it. Walk away. Shut your mouth. Don't retaliate. Forgive and pray while you're walking. Help me, Lord. Take the anger out, Lord. But you are grabbing on to God and walking away from nonsense. And that is the way God wants it. When I was talking about how the government has these special ops, in that movie, this man literally had to break his leg in order to live. He had to break his own leg in order to survive. Then he had to find natural things in the land to, to, to splint it up, wrap it real good so he'd have support so that he could still walk on that leg as if putting it in a brace. And that was the only way he could survive. And he still wounded like that brother man still had to fight his way to safety still doing battle trying to get out alive see my question to you is do you want to get out alive or do you want to walk into the enemy's camp and lay your weapons down, shedding your armor as you go, leaving it on the ground. No, no, you don't want to do that. We've got to be strong in the power of his might. Prove to the enemy we are the army of the Lord, and we won the victory. We don't give in. We don't give up. We don't wave a white flag in front of the devil. You don't whip out in front of, in front of your enemy. No, why? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I did the video the other day about how the devil will tell you to bend over and crack a smile. Don't you dare bend over. I'll raise my foot if I see you bend over. No, you stand up straight. You face the enemy headlong. In the name of Jesus, in the power of his might, not yours. Kick the devil in the teeth, kick him in the balls, punch him in the eye, whatever you got to do. You tie that sucker up and bind him like a little pig. Go on the, to the slaughter. You bind him in the name of Jesus. You rebuke him in the name of Jesus. No, you raise your foot and you kick his butt out. Kick him to the curb. Don't let him kick you to the curb while you cower in the corner because you're afraid. No. What are you afraid of? You got the power. You got everything on your side. Angels, God, the Holy Ghost, the name of Jesus. You got all that on your side. And you're sitting up here cowering from some nonsense. The one who's mainly afraid of you. That's like cowering in the corner from a little chihuahua. Oh, God, he's going to get me. Oh, stop. No. 
You go with all you can. You give God all you can. You represent. You live holy. You live strong. You live in courage. You straighten up your back. You don't give in to your emotions. You don't give in to your thoughts. Lord, am I thinking sour? Is that my flesh or is that your spirit? Because if it's my flesh, Lord, shut it down. I don't want to give my flesh, I don't want to give my flesh an audience for nothing. And I sure don't want to give the devil any of my attention. See, the devil mixed the truth with lies. And sometimes you think you're hearing from God and you're not. And you act on it without asking God first. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. But most of the time, what are you acknowledging? What you're feeling. No, shut those emotions down. They don't deserve that kind of worship. They don't deserve that kind of attention. Because your emotions half the time are mixed with the devil's lies. Be careful with that. That's called flesh. That's right. So you got to be careful. You got to ask God to give you discernment. You got to ask God to put a new level of determination in you so that you don't give in. See, that man I was talking about in the movie who had all that specialized training, he beat everybody the government sent at him. They, the government was trying to, to, to null and void that bad boy. Nobody. He was almost indestructible because of his training. He depended on his training. He used his mind over matter. He used his mind over the pain. He thought he went through strat strategy and strategic moves. and He knew how to create things out of, out of bare uh, elements that were around him because he was trained so well and they just couldn't outthink the man. See, most of the battle that we win is not from our mouth, it's not from our body, it's from our mind. That's where the war starts, in the mind, the battle of the mind. And you will win the battle in your mind or you will lose the battle in your mind and your body will follow suit. So what I say is, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in Romans chapter 12, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. And I'm going to leave you with that word. It says it all. Get in the word. Renew your mind. Get in God's face. Renew your mind. Where your mind is, your life will follow. Have the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen.